welcome everybody to Policy Exchange. Uh, thank you so much for coming down on this extremely miserably rainy day, which is a day that gives London stereotypes about its weather. Um, we are here today uh, because we're joined by Professor Rory Medcalf from the Australian National University, who's the head of the National Security College there. Um, and it's a real pleasure to have him here in London with us. Um, and it's also a pleasure to host him here on my first event under my new hat as Head of Foreign Policy here at Policy Exchange. Um, Professor Metcalf um, has had a very long and varied career, started in journalism, uh, he's worked in diplomacy, intelligence, in think tanks, <coughs> policy research and academia. He worked at what is now known in Australia as the Office of National Intelligence, which is Australia's peak intelligence agency. He served as a diplomat in postings in India, in Japan, the Indo-Pacific. He's recognized as being one of Australia's foremost thinkers on foreign policy and security matters and, and globally recognized leader in terms of the Indo-Pacific strategic concept. Um, we also like to offer our congratulations to Rory on being made a member of the Order of Australia in the Queen's birthday honors earlier this year for his service. So uh, we are just going to have a relaxed conversation. Uh, there's an enormous amount uh, of subjects to touch on, so um, we'll go through that, and then I'd love to open up to the audience and, and also to our um, very sizable audience watching online. So um, please, uh, while we're talking, start to think of any uh, questions that you might want to uh, approach later. So um, I'm just going to kick it off by talking about where we're at now in terms of uh, there's been a change of government in Australia. The Labour Party is in power after a very long time on the sidelines there. Um, how would you characterize the feel, the sort of tone, the priorities of this uh, new government? And how is that distinct from the previous government that we had just before? It's a great place to start. And thank you for hosting me, uh, Sophia, and the Policy Exchange. Uh, more generally, it is a real privilege to be here. There's lots of ground to cover, and you've, you've raised the bar with that generous uh, introduction. So thank you. A few things. Firstly, I think one of the reasons um, I'm here in the United Kingdom at the moment is to get both a sense of where uh, UK foreign and security policy is going, to perhaps offer an alternative view on the Australian uh, position, the way that Australia's place in the world is developing, and obviously look at the, the really important convergences and opportunities there. And so I think the story of Australian foreign and security policy over really the last decade, and remember we had uh, nine years of uh, three conservative governments, uh, Abbott turned to the Morrison governments until May of this year, now we have the Labor government under uh, Anthony Albanese. The, um, the story of those years was, politics aside, um, an extraordinary wake-up call on the strategic challenges that Australia was facing in the world and in our region in the Indo-Pacific. Um, a lot of that is about China, it's not all about China, but um, a huge amount of that is really about the challenge that Chinese power and influence have posed to Australia and the way in which Australia as a, a middle power and a democracy uh, protects its interests in that, in that context. Now that sets the scene for thinking about the, uh, the direction of the new government and I think one thing that's, that's absolutely striking over the past six months now, since May, when the um, Albanese government was elected, is that there has not been a fundamental shift in foreign and security policy. There have been some important substantial uh, adjustments, and I think the most, the clearest of those is uh, a message of stabilisation of relations with China. That's been crystallised literally in the past few hours by the meeting between our Prime Minister and President Xi on the sidelines of the G20 in Bali. But the national security settings below the surface are precisely the same. And what's extraordinary, uh, and a real lesson, I think, for other democracies, is that Australia hasn't resiled one bit from the substance <coughs> of its um, self-awareness and self-protection and, and pushback against Chinese power. It has been more disciplined in the, in the rhetoric in recent months. Just a couple of other points about the difference between this government and previous governments. There is, in the tradition of Australian Labor foreign policy, a greater emphasis on the immediate region or the neighbourhood, uh, Southeast Asia and the South Pacific as well. 
You can argue that these um, are matters of degree rather than profound difference, but that's certainly a very strong message from the, the Foreign Minister in particular. And of course, if you get beyond the, the obvious uh, foreign policy and defence settings of policy, if you look at broader social and economic policy, this is a progressive government. They do have um, a big agenda, you know, <coughs> from uh, social justice through to uh, sort of climate policy positions that are much closer to, I'd say, the, the democratic global mainstream than, than uh, the Morrison government was. But this is all in an environment of enormous strategic challenge. And so I think the like-mindedness among democracies is still there. I just want to um, ask you about the sort of whistle-stop tour that uh, Foreign Minister Penny Wong uh, was taking uh, around the Pacific. Yes. She uh, was an extraordinarily <laughs> a busy traveller in her first few months. Um, it, it was something we'd never really seen before um, from Australian Foreign Minister sort of getting out there so quickly and rapidly and moving from place to place. Uh, obviously, there was a big strategic impetus around China's sort of um, increasing security role and, and relationships uh, with some of these countries, in, including the Solomon Islands. Um, how much do you see that and, and the attention and resources that have been devoted to that as something that was responding to an urgent crisis moment or something that is about a broader structural repositioning of how the government is going to engage in the Pacific? So again, there's a, I mean, it, there's almost, I mean, it's, it, it's tough time strategically, but there's a kind of sweet spot of um, congruence of different policy objectives here. I mean, there is that, um, that labor tradition of engagement with the immediate neighborhood, an obvious emphasis on uh, foreign aid and development and so forth, um, a message uh, which, in fact, we were hearing also under the, um, the Morrison and Turnbull governments of, of the region as being, in a sense, our family, our Pacific family. But there's a hard strategic uh, imperative behind all of this. And even though you don't hear the word China mentioned as uh, frequently or um, you know, with as much force in some of the policy pronouncements of this government, of course this is about preserving the sovereignty of small states, <coughs> preserving Australia's position in the Pacific as their, um, really their preferred uh, partner for security and governance, because China has been moving in in such a profound way in, in recent years. Security agreements with the Solomon Islands, uh, challenges to the integrity of resources in the region, questions about the, uh, the corruption that accompanies a lot of uh, economic engagement with those countries. So at the moment, we're in a kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it a honeymoon period because the government's hit the ground running and that's, and that's, and that's really good, uh, but we're at a stage where we're beginning to define the contours of Australia and allies and partners, uh, giving small island countries in our region options that are not simply uh, Chinese largesse with all sorts of political strings attached or uh, a purely American-led response to China, and that's in fact where, you know, whether it's the United Kingdom or other partners globally, uh, frankly, there's, there's space for many flags in, um, in that response. You mentioned the Albanese um, President Xi bilat that just took mm. place, um, and the really fascinating language uh, in the immediate readout that came out from that is, is, is something that very much struck me. Mm. How do you think, kind of more institutionally in Canberra, the, the view on China, how the thinking on China is evolving. W w there was this sort of turmoil moment. There was a on the back foot mm. kind of reactive moment. There, there's been a lot of friction and conflict, the trade wars and so on. Um, how do you see things? I mean, there is a sense of stabilizing there in the relationship, mm. but what does that stability look like? So the stability is very fragile and even that word I choose in a fairly guarded way um, language that some use and that the Chinese would prefer to use, which is essentially a reset in the relationship. That's just not realistic. That's not going to happen. So it's a fragile stability. Uh, the deeper strategic assessments and judgments underlying all of this, I mean, this is my own personal sense of it uh, from being in a role that is, I guess, one step removed from the security community, uh, but you can easily read between the lines of speeches by even our Defence Minister just over the weekend, uh, Richard Miles, is that uh, the, um, the full spectrum strategic challenge is there, that uh, 
Chinese power is not only challenging the position of the United States in the region, and I think it's an incredibly important corrective that we all have to work on, is um, adjusting that narrative that this whole story is a US-China competition. If only America would be not confrontational, we could all live in peace. Instead, uh, the growth of Chinese power and influence and the connection of that to the need for absolute control domestically uh, that Xi Jinping has demonstrated you know, just a month ago with the, um, the, uh, the People's Field of the National Congress. All of that suggests that the challenge of setting limits to Chinese power and influence, of um, deterrence, of creating um, a groundwork for, for mutual respect uh, and for coexistence, but not a lot more than that, that's all still there with this government. That's informed by security and intelligence communities. It's informed by allied perceptions. And importantly, I think it's informed by the judgments of a lot of other powers in our region and the world. You know, talk to the Japanese about this, talk to the Indians, the Vietnamese, the Philippines, talk to our friends uh, across Europe, talk to the South Koreans. Uh, there's a really common theme emerging that we need to manage Chinese power in a multipolar system uh, competition without conflict, and that sometimes is going to involve making some, some pretty hard decisions on our side. One thing that really strikes me is that for a very long time there's been a conversation in Australia about whether or not how, how best Australia can balance its relationships with the United States yeah. and China, and you've just mentioned that sort of competition frame, and that, that has been the ongoing you know, subject of a lot of intellectual space in, in Australia is always this idea of, of this yeah. careful balancing act. Given the events of the last few years and mm. the deterioration of the Australia-China relationship in that, you know, is that still a meaningful framework? Does that even make sense now, considering where Australia is at in its relationship with both China and the United States? I think it's not been uh, the most meaningful framework for a long time. Uh, and so I've been very resistant to that idea that it all boils down to you know, a bipolarity in the Indo-Pacific or globally. And that in a sense to, for example, resist uh, Chinese influence or interference or coercion, and we can get, get onto that because a lot of the story of recent years, of course, was the Chinese economic coercion uh, against Australia, that somehow we have to agree with every single policy pronouncement that comes out of the United States, whether it's Trump's America or, or Biden's. The reality is far more subtle, and most countries in our region, I think, privately understand this. Certainly governments, again, like Japan's and India's, get it. I think that's where Australian policy is actually coming from, but it's very hard to convey that narrative in the public domain. It's very hard to compete with the kind of noise uh, and, indeed, guided propaganda that we get, uh, whether it's out of China or elsewhere, the, the misinformation, if you like, if you like, that this is all about confrontation and containment uh, and, and we're all essentially you know, puppets with strings being pulled in, in, in Washington. So adding that sophistication to the Australian debate has been hard, um, but showing respect to powers like you know, India, Japan, Indonesia, Vietnam, you know, this incredibly rich region that we live in, and showing respect to the fact that there are global stakeholders in the Indo-Pacific, that the, 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 the British tilt or the European turn to the Indo-Pacific are, you know, are serious things reflecting interests. Those are all pieces of the solution. And I think you know, if I have an opportunity to engage with interlocutors over here, it's again encouraging that kind of more um, layered thinking that this is not simply a China versus America choice. In fact, uh, you know, hypothetically, for example, and I don't think this is going to happen, but if the United States were not a strategic actor in the Indo-Pacific, our strategic problems are not suddenly going to go away. You know, Japan is not suddenly going to um, accept um, that it's going to live in a Chinese-dominated order. Uh, so it's in the interests of multipolarity and the interests of all the powers to keep the Americans engaged and to avoid that false um, binary that, that you just uh, reminded me of. <laughs> Sorry to trigger you there. Um, <laughs> a, another interesting sort of framework that I think you know, has been very a, a kind of ongoing subject of debate in, in, in Australia that has very much played out in choices of parties in power and prime ministers and so on is this kind of question about Australia's identity, yeah. trying to balance between its historical relationships with the UK, yeah. the Anglosphere, its identity as a nation of immigrants and a 
deeply multicultural society and also its geographical position in Asia. Mm. How do you see that conversation going? Because that it, it is the debate and the tensions between those three different aspects of Australia's identity mm. that so often seem to play out at the very sharpest ends yeah. of Australia's political outcomes. Yeah, and I think it's not only... I, I, I think you're absolutely right that these are very live issues in Australian um, policy-making and politics, but also that issues of national identity are very easily uh, distorted internationally. Mm -hmm. They're you know, easy to have misperceptions about this. I guess my starting point is to acknowledge you know, that Australia is a, an extraordinarily multicultural country. That's something certainly that the new government is emphasising in a lot of its external policy projection. Uh, that it's a country with, for example, uh, a, um, you know, an extraordinary uh, First Nations history, that the indigenous uh, identity of, of, um, of, of Australia, the First Nations identity of Australia has been, if you like, downplayed in, in policy um, in, uh, over many recent decades, but now this government is looking to project that. But at the same time, our institutions, you know, there's no question that we have liberal democratic institutions and, and, and this very deep uh, cultural and indeed trust-based connection, uh, not only to uh, you know, Britain, the United States, um, Anglosphere countries, not, not, not a term that I uh, particularly use, but also to uh, liberal democracy uh, you know, more broadly. Um, that's a really important bedrock of Australian identity. When you start putting these pieces together, the, um, the enormous multicultural success of Australia, and just to put some statistics out there, the fact that you know, around 30% of Australians were born in another country. Uh, more than half of the population was either born in another, in another country or has at least one parent born in another country. You know, it makes uh, the United States look pretty sedentary uh, by comparison. And of course, I know, you know Britain has very proud multiculturalism too. So um, that is a huge strength for Australia that we probably haven't um, leveraged enough in our external policy settings, but even issues like um, bringing much greater diversity into our policy community, our national security agencies. Uh, it makes sense in every way in terms of capability, equity and inclusion as, as well. So these tensions have played out. Um, when you look at it very, uh, and I'm certainly not um, accusing you of this, but when one looks at it you know, in a very uh, simple lens and says, well, you know, the, uh, the Labor side of politics in Australia is much more wedded to multiculturalism and a, and a sense of Australia's identity in the Indo-Pacific, mm -hmm. the conservative side of politics is more wedded to the Anglosphere, you know, Western liberal tradition. Um, of course, that's a, that, that's a great oversimplification. And I think what we are likely to see over the next few years is a new effort to reconcile those two. <coughs> um, so that it's, with the government we have at present, uh, on the one hand, we have a foreign minister you know, uh, born in Southeast Asia, uh, very proud uh, to be an Australian of Southeast Asian origin who is projecting a really strong message of inclusion for Southeast Asia. At the same time, our Defence Minister, uh, not only true to his portfolio, but true to one thread of the tradition of his own um, political party, is looking at the United States, um, looking at AUKUS as well, so therefore looking at the United Kingdom, uh, particularly in that context, and recognising that we need a robust defence force to protect this extraordinary, dynamic, multicultural Australia in a region um, that otherwise may not be so friendly to a, a middle-sized democracy with enormous resources and with um, institutions uh, based on openness, trust and transparency. So I'm, I'm reasonably confident that we can reconcile uh, that divide and turn it into a strength, um, but it will be, the story will be distorted from time to time in our politics and certainly if again you look at the, um, the Chinese uh, misinformation that there has been uh, and perhaps not only Chinese misinformation um, around AUKUS, the argument that this is some Anglosphere plot, it's simply Australia, the US and the UK trying to restore some vaguely you know, neo-colonial mission in Asia, uh, that completely misses the message that AUKUS is about building Australian capability to deter coercion and hegemony in our region, mm -hmm. and that's good for, among others, many of our Asian friends and partners. Mm -hmm. I'd like to come back to AUKUS, but just sort of saying on this, this point about the nation, I think something mm. both you and I have been uh, doing a lot of thinking about is, is the question of how you break down these traditional, very hard walls between foreign policy and national yes. security and, where, and the people whose interests they 
they are serving. Um, you know, the, it, it, it's self-evident that uh, the, the domestic international interactions at the moment mm -hmm. are uh, kind of more extraordinary and more visible than they have been in a very long time. There, there's a sort of, you know, retail politics element to a lot of what is happening mm -hmm. geopolitics. Mm -hmm. It, geopolitically, what are some of the difficult conversations that you think still need to be had in Australia from the foreign policy and national security community to the Australian people to help them understand the choices that are being made? Wow, there's a lot there. Um, and so I guess the starting point is you know, to understand what, what, what a unique combination Australia is in many ways. You know, we, relatively small population, very diverse population, uh, very um, distributed geography, you know, this, this extraordinary continent, um, a federation, so um, you know, a lot of power that's still with state and territory governments, as we discovered during COVID, when suddenly we had you know, the lockdowns on um, internal borders, and a really strong private sector as well. I mean, so much of the wealth and the innovation in Australia is rightly in the private sector and, and, and universities. And so our Commonwealth government, our federal government, uh, don't have all the answers, and yet they traditionally had the national security responsibilities, which until recently were mostly about external defence, but now, of course, are about that whole geoeconomic spectrum, that resilience spectrum of defending the nation from external uh, threats, of maintaining uh, cohesion, resilience, uh, sort of a durable society at home, um, and being prepared for shocks, whether it's COVID, whether it's... Uh, climate, uh, whether it's China, you know, whatever it might be, whether it's the supply chain impacts we're all feeling from the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So I think we've just started that journey of building a new Australian national security framework, a really you know, a genuinely inclusive framework where uh, the private sector, where state governments, where civil society, where universities all have a role to play, doing it in a way that is democratic, that is federal, and that is not basically turning the country into Sparta. Um, and so it's going to be really hard. It's going to require political leadership, uh, political leadership that is honest about the, the risks uh, and the threats we face, uh, the fact that we're not going back to the, the happy days, for example, of a um, entirely risk-free economic relationship with China that we thought we had, or some of our policymakers and certainly our business community thought we had 10 or 15 years ago. We're not going back to an era when you can separate um, technology from security, from even education. I mean, the fact that in my sector in universities now, uh, we have to look at the security risks as well as the enormous educational and other opportunities that come with, um, with having vast numbers of students from, from many other countries. We're just beginning to build that national narrative and it requires, it will require uh, political leadership to level with the public and say that you know, difficult times are ahead, uh, that we're going to have to be the sum of our parts when it comes to national security, um, cyber security, for example, and we've just had some major um, cyber incidents in Australia that will wake up millions of Australians to the fact that they do need to take responsibility in many ways for their own cyber security. And what's the end of this story? You know, it's not, I don't think, that suddenly we'll wake up in five years' time and have a perfect um, democratic, uh, inclusive national security or national resilience uh, situation apparatus uh, where all threats and risks um, are, are mitigated or, or are absent. But it does mean we've got a fighting chance in a contested region, in a world where globalisation is never going to be the same as the one, you know, the globalisation we all imagined uh, 15 or 20 years ago, and where we can work with other like minded uh, middle powers and allies. To, to really buy time, set limits to uh, the authoritarian challenge, set limits to the disruptions that we're seeing uh, from Russia, from China, and from many uh, non-state threats, and therefore build, I guess, a geopolitically sustainable future. That's a long answer to your question, but it is something that I've been thinking about, and it clearly applies in pretty much every democracy you can think of. There's only a small number, I think, uh, particularly in the Nordic countries, that are beginning to uh, get the settings right. It does strike me as well that, you know, coming, coming into your role from quite a diverse background in terms of you've, you know, worked in a, a bunch of different industries, mm. a bunch of different posts and places and so yeah. on, that that's the sort of something that we might need to actually institutionally embed as yeah. a bit more of the status quo moving forward because 
those narratives and those capacity to, the capacity to understand you know how citizens think and so on yeah. and those connectivity points are, are becoming more important yeah and it is about the, the relationship between the citizen and the state I mean mm. in a sense essentially coming back to the question that citizens have responsibility for national security too so absolutely just to bring things back into our region here in the Euro Atlantic mm. um, I think that it, it is clear that while the institutional relationship between Australia and the UK is you know, as strong and vibrant as it's ever been. Mm, mm. Um, some of the political dynamism on both sides and the changes of government um, in, in Australia has sort of put a little bit of friction in some of the mm. political level relationships that yeah. have been established recently and which were such a driving force behind AUKUS and the trade deal and so on. Um, so, so I think that coupled with uh, Foreign Minister Wong's, mm. you know, very strong immediate focus on the Indo-Pacific has sort of raised some questions about how much Australia mm. is going to be investing under the new government in these traditional relationships, mm. like with Britain. At the same time, it strikes me that one of the most significant geopolitical decisions of, of recent years was Australia's very quick reflex to say, yes, we will be supporting Ukraine, yes, we will be yep. sending lethal aid, and, and so on, and a, a wide spectrum of other support, which, you know, Australia is not in NATO, yep. this is a war outside of its region. Um, so I'm just wondering how you think about those two different, uh, I suppose, th th those, th those two different scenarios and how they're interacting and what that tells us about how Canberra is sort of weighing up the choices that <coughs> are going to be made. Look, firstly, of course, um, it's relatively early days in a new government, six months in. Um, they did, as I say, hit the ground running with a lot of the national security settings of the previous government. Uh, in many ways, the China challenge gave them no choice. Um, so that's probably a healthy thing because it means a lot of that, that reinventing of the policy wheel that we often get with new governments uh, hasn't had to happen. Um, we don't have time for that anyway. Having said that, there are different points of emphasis. I think the, um, you know, one of the stories of recent years was the, uh, you know, the extreme political closeness of um, governments in Canberra and London. And there was obviously an interests and a values element to that, but there was also very much a, a partisan comfort uh, with the, uh, particularly the Morrison government uh, and uh, Boris Johnson's government have been, uh, you know, that, uh, I guess, if there'd been a conservative government still in Australia, would 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 continue. But I think there was always uh, risk involved in being over political or over ideological in that in that comfort. I mean, a, you know, personal anecdote, if you like. Um, I'm a strong supporter of the capability uh, logic of AUKUS. I think it makes a lot of sense. I'm a strong supporter of the UK role in the Indo-Pacific and an Australian role as a partner. To NATO as well. Uh, our effort on Ukraine uh, is admirable, and we, I hope, we can do more. But there is risk when you, you know, you see uh, the British, Australian, and American leaders uh, with lots and lots of red, white, and blue flags, um, talking about uh, what is essentially a highly trusted technology sharing arrangement in um, very political terms, and, 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 and in terms that have a strong, very strong sense of, of, of national uh, identity to them as well. And so I think it's actually healthier in some ways that we build AUKUS as a uh, capability-based arrangement, an interest-based arrangement, and yes, it's protecting our shared liberal democratic values, but it's also not a partnership that is somehow exclusive of uh, Britain working with Europe or Australia working with the Quad or Australia working with Southeast Asia. These things can be mutually reinforcing. I hope and I believe that's the place where um, where our government is is heading, uh, certainly below the surface. And I think if you read the I think the, the speech that Richard Miles gave when he was in the United Kingdom a few months ago, that, that was I think the tenor of that as well. But I do think that uh, that needs to be understood in the context of where you know the Australian Labor tradition is, uh, where, where there is almost a kind of a, um, a sport of and, and, and a, um, a tradition that probably is a bit more serious than, than, than simply um, you know political slogans of being um, somewhat suspicious of the value that the United Kingdom brings to the relationship with Australia. There's a you know a post-colonial bit of baggage 
there. Uh, that's, that's pretty understandable if you start looking at the traditions of the Australian Labor Party. But I think at a deeper level, if you look at the extraordinary trust in the relationship between our national security community, <coughs> if you look at the extraordinary, uh, at all levels, diaspora and social and cultural connections between Australia and the UK, and the fact that we actually uh, I'm going to use a word here that Xi Jinping used um, today, but I use it in a different context. We genuinely cherish one another as, um, as societies and, and as nations, and we cherish one another for the very fact that we're liberal democracies, where we're very happy to be openly critical of ourselves and one another as well. Uh, you know, if a, um, a government of any political hue in Australia or in the United Kingdom can approach the relationship in that way, then I think there's, um, the, 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 there's a truly strategic future ahead. And I, I would even avoid using the word traditional when I talk about that. It's, in a sense, it's a, it's a relationship that's been rediscovered. Is there any risk to AUKUS posed by questions of Australian republicanism? No. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure where that question came from, but I don't... But I, um, I think that there will be... There will be the beginnings of a resurgence of, of Australian republicanism over the next few years. I think that um, it makes sense. It's um, quite understandable. It's very much uh, not only in the Labor tradition, but I think in many ways, you know, if you look particularly at um, some parts of the Liberal Party, remember Malcolm Turnbull yep. uh, was leader of the Republican movement in Australia in the 1990s. Um, there's there's a trend in that direction, uh, and I think the uh, you know the ideal outcome, and I'm. I guess I see myself in the Republican <laughs> tradition in Australia as, as well. I think the ideal outcome is that in time, with a kind of uh, very friendly uh, consent, you know, Australia will probably move to a republic. Having said that, um, there's been no rush. There still is no rush. Um, it's not a top priority of this, of this government, uh, I don't believe, in their first term. It may become one in their second term but it has absolutely no bearing on strategic alignment. Um, and I think in that sense, uh, whether Australia is or isn't a republic five or 10 years from now, I'm absolutely confident it will have no impact on the security of the relationship. I, I agree with you. I think the very long time frames yeah. bandied about, <laughs> about parts of uh, the AUKUS alliance uh, naturally raise those questions. Um, just. To focus in on AUKUS then before we um, open up for questions. Well, I should add that there is at least one republic in AUKUS already. Uh, well, yes. <laughs> um, it very, it's very striking that in Canberra, you know, as soon as AUKUS was announced, yeah. Prime Minister and Cabinet, machinery of government, everything was organised to yeah. prioritise this. Yes. You know, extra AUKUS diplomats were sent yeah. to different posts. There, there has been a really, really fundamental shift in thinking where AUKUS becomes a prism yep. through which you understand Australia's kind of vital security interests. It is existential for Australia. That's how it's mm. been framed. Um, here in the UK, it has not played such a prominent role. I think there was a lot of interest and, and sort of mm. goodwill towards the alliance when it was announced. Um, there are certainly people in government mm. doing very serious work on this. Um, but, but it has not become so central to the way in which we're yeah. tackling the, the very large suite of foreign policy challenges that, that we're addressing. How do you think we can move the UK to a place of being more ambitious about yeah. the potential of AUKUS? Because it does strike me that particularly in pillar two capabilities, which is around technology, things where Britain has a demonstrated expertise, yeah that if we actually harness that full potential, it could become more existential to our security um, and resilience framework. Yeah. But how, how, from the Canberra view, how can we get Britain more engaged in, in AUKUS? And what's been your experience so far to talking to people in government while you've been here about that? Okay, well, without um, breaching too many confidences of <laughs> conversations I'm having in government, um, I can give a, a sense of... Um, I guess, of, 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 of direction of conversations. But more importantly, understanding the Australian response to AUKUS, uh, you know, is, uh, has, has been incredibly illuminating for those of us who thought the Australian bureaucracy <coughs> is not capable of rapidly mobilising and very effectively mobilising on a priority national security issue. 
It, it is. It's been something to see. Uh, so there's uh, 12 months on, 13 months on. There's a very substantial uh, bureaucracy across the Australian government with just that mission. And the mission is not only uh, the nuclear powered submarine uh, program, but also, as you say, pillar two, uh, the everything else, the advanced technologies, uh, quantum, cyber, uh, you know, underwater technologies, autonomous. Uh, it, 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 it's actually um, a really impressive sign that the Australian bureaucracy can get moving when, when, it, when it has to. And in a sense, we're almost at risk of overwhelming our British and even our American friends with the scale of our national effort. That's coming from the middle power of 25 million people. Um, there's, there's great depth and seriousness of purpose on our side. And I think there is seriousness of purpose uh, among both the other August partners as well. And of course, uh, you know, the Americans have scale anyway. In the case of Britain, uh, I think it is different. I think uh, there was there was clearly uh, a set of priorities that, uh, that Boris Johnson had when he agreed to AUKUS and announced it. I think it's always risky to put these things in terms of um, domestic policy or jobs or employment or anything like that uh, because there's actually a much more profound strategic narrative that needs to be, uh, I think, socialised in the British system. Australia is a much more capable power um, indefinitely into the future, uh, a global partner, an Indo-Pacific partner as well, and in, in the region where, which is the pivot of global strategic competition where, where Chinese power is, is rising. Um, a, a pooling of the uh, extraordinary innovation uh, and technology capabilities of the three countries. You know, we, we always think of, I guess, the three countries in a very clear order of the United States, Britain, uh, and, and, and Australia, but there'll be absolutely no free riding in this relationship. If you look at our industry, at our universities, at defence and intelligence establishments, it's a, it, it, it's a very, very powerful combination. And so much of AUKUS will be about unlocking barriers, unlocking internal barriers, not simply to do with things like export controls, but with uh, you know, accelerated innovation, with information sharing, with actually mobilising the university sector. And that's a really important point to note here, that in Australia, universities are traditionally very suspicious of anything to do with national security. Uh, they were persuaded in recent years, for example, to sign up to our, um, our foreign interference schemes and rules to manage uh, the risks uh, there. But normally they're not volunteers in the national security effort. That is not true when it comes to AUKUS. Australian universities are, are, are lining up to demonstrate not only the capability that they have to develop the technology, educate the AUKUS workforce, be part of the national effort, um, but they're willing to cooperate in this regard, which is also a very nice thing uh, when you uh, have worked in the university sector for a long time. You know, a speech by my Vice-Chancellor uh, on this point last week, I think, is worth, is worth noting. That needs to happen in the British system as well, um, because there's already a very organic uh, relationship between Australia and the British universities, but I get the impression uh, that the university system in the United Kingdom does not yet recognise comprehensively that it's going to have to be part of a national security effort in years to come to protect the very freedoms um, that academic freedom is, is all about. Industry is another big part of that. So building a kind of a, a parallel AUKUS process with industry and universities I think is going to be just as important in a way to building the highly classified and compartmentalised work that, that's going on in the, in the submarine space. Uh, and I think everything I've said is true, no matter whether the decision, I think in February or March next year, that's announced about the submarine capability pathway is particularly uh, UK-centric or, or US-centric. All three powers are going to be in this together. Could not agree more. Um, let's go to some questions now. Um, I want to bring, we might start with a question from our online audience, um, uh, as I'm sure they've been waiting patiently. Um, we have Peter Matheson from the University of Edinburgh, Principal and Vice-Chancellor. Very appropriate. Questions. Peter, um, I want to bring, we might start with a question from our online audience. Um, um, we have Stephen Matheson from the University of uh, Peter, are you able to unmute yourself? We might start with a question from our online. Okay. Well, 
yeah, let's uh, let's go to the room then, and we'll come we'll come back um, <coughs> online. If you could just uh, state your name and where you're from before you ask your question, the gentleman with the towel. Thank you, I'm Edward Towel, Lefty customer. Thank you, Edward Towel, Lefty Constellation, University of Oxford. Um, thank you for for your your remarks. You used the word middle path yeah. numerous times throughout. Um, talk about Australia's role in foreign yeah. policy and in, and in security strategy. Yeah. Um, but the way in which you sort of envisage Australia's role, whether in terms of AUKUS, the Indo Pacific, or beyond, slightly suggests this move away from a direction of the behaviour of a middle path yeah. towards, dare I say it, a would be great path. Um, I'm just curious. If you uh, could I, I'm not. I'm. I'm not laughing at you. I'm just um, a bit wary of putting great power in Australia in the same sentence. <laughs> no, look. I'm very happy. Let me. Do you want me to answer that one now? Absolutely. Or, yeah. Look, that's a good question, and uh, you know, the use of the term middle power is a bit lazy. I acknowledge that. So actually, I, I'm quite happy to be pulled up on that. I've often used the term middle player uh, in talking about Australia in the Indo-Pacific, partly because we're not the US or China, and partly because it's neutral as to the size of the country. I mean, in many ways, if you look at um, the... And I don't think we have the right lexicon for this, frankly, in international relations. And so, you know, there'll be a great um, award for you if you can write the book that gives us the, the new lexicon. Um, Australia, Japan, India, uh, you know, Singapore, Vietnam, I mean, these countries vary enormously by pretty much every measure but they're all countries that are substantial players in the international system. They can defend themselves, they have defended themselves, uh, but they don't tend to have the capacity to comprehensively coerce others, uh, which I think is one of the attributes of, of, of great power. Uh, so what are we? A former foreign minister, Julie Bishop, who's now the chancellor of my university, has liked to use the term a top 20 country because Australia ranks around 12 or 13 um, by GDP or defence budget. You know, actually in the, in, in the high end of things. Uh, but still, we need allies. We're not, we're not a country without enormous interests that can protect and advance them all single-handedly. And so, yes, I think Australia can and will play a larger role in the Indo-Pacific, will play a global, a global role where we can, um, but we'll always try to do that in good company. And being a country that's <coughs> more capable um, self-reliant to a degree, but more capable overall, and that's partly what AUKUS is about, is going to enable us to uh, build the partnerships and to contribute to their interests as well. Um, so please come back to me when you, when you have the right um, language. <laughs> it's funny, uh, Australia sort of on, on the up in thinking about how it defines itself. Britain's foreign policy debate is so often characterised by this declinist instinct, uh, picturing ourselves on the way down, which, you know, just seems quite absurd. Perhaps something where we can learn something from Australia. Well, I couldn't possibly comment on, on Britain's path, but, I, but you know, again, if you look, if you look globally, um, you know, Britain and a number of our key European partners, uh, you know, France, Germany, I mean, th these, are, these are powers that are still um, hugely consequential by any measure. Uh, and so it is a little bit strange to hear that decline. I agree. Um, this gentleman here. Thanks, so I'm Tim Smith, I'm an MP from Victoria. Um, uh, thank you for your, your speech, Rory. Um, we have the Republican debate another day, mate. The, um, my question is about our capability gap in submarines. Yep. So the Collins class comes to the end of life at the end of this decade. We won't get our hands on a nuclear submarine until the end of the 2030s, I would presume. What is your view about what we're going to do for that decade where to any reasonable observer, we're going to have a significant capability gap under the oceans around our near neighbourhood. Yep. No, that's it's, it's a good, important question, and that capability gap is a term that we're hearing a lot in the Australian debate uh, at, at present. So, obviously, not going to pre um, pre judge or even uh, attempt to guess what the uh, submarine capability pathway announcement will be in, in March. Uh, and I, again, I would hope that it includes uh, a very clear message about how we address this capability gap, or, or you know, a, a set of objectives for addressing the capability gap. Remember there also, as you would know, there's also the defence strategic review that will come out at around the same time, and these will be, I hope, closely coordinated. 
and the Defence Strategic Review will be very much about what we do in the near term for Australia's security in a contested environment. So I'm, I'm hoping to see things like an emphasis on Australian uh, ability to uh, protect itself through having, if you like, ground-based uh, strike um, into uh, contested parts of the region if that's necessary, stockpiling musician, uh, munitions, all the enablers there, stockpiling musicians would be probably <laughs> not a good idea. Stockpiling munitions, um, having all those enablers in, in place. What do we do about a submarine capability gap? Well, I think um, we've got to look at this over two time frames. I think the, the contest for influence in our region is going to be a story of decades. This is not going to be over in, in five years. Um, you could even argue that having an Australian uh, SSN fleet is um, going to be the capability we need if 15 or 20 years from now we find that our efforts to prevent China from dominating the region fail, for example. Um, so, and that's just one hypothetical there. But at the same time, there's going to be a near-term period of great risk and tension. You know, I think a lot of assessments are that tensions across the Taiwan Strait will be at their highest. Um, over the next decade, perhaps not the next couple of years, but let's say 25 to 2030, when you look at the changing military balance, when you look at the political calculus uh, that the Chinese leadership makes. So we've got to be ready for tough times relatively soon as well. Um, and so whether we like it or not, the existing Australian conventional submarine fleet, you know, the Collins class, will be around for quite a long time yet, and, and that would be the force we have, for example, if there were a scenario in the next, in the next 10 years. It's the first half of the 2030s in many ways that's the real window of um, capability gap risk there. And I think that's where some of the creative ideas that are in play, I think the, the idea of leasing is not completely off the table, um, an idea which um, I personally would favour if, uh, if, if we settle on an SSN pathway, a nuclear power submarine pathway, uh, that we don't go for the um, highly ambitious build all of as much of it as possible in, in Australia, which has often been the, um, you know, the, the industry policy side of um, Australian submarine um, programs. But in fact, uh, there may be ways t uh, for Australian uh, funding to actually uh, accelerate production, whether it's in the United States or, or Britain. I don't think any of those are off the table. There's also finally that question of whether in fact for a short window there, you can emphasise non-submarine capabilities to provide the kind of coverage that you need um, having a uh, much more capable strike, for example, air, land, um, greater emphasis on unmanned and autonomous systems. None of that's perfect for managing our interests in the vast Indo-Pacific, which I think we do need SSNs for, but if it's about um, creating uh, defensive barriers in the short term, I think there'll be other ways to go about it. I think you're absolutely right to be focused on it. Um, <coughs> I think it's a, it's a shared policy failure of the Australian um, national security defence uh, policy community and our political class over the past 20 years uh, that we've got ourselves into this situation. When you talk about some of those time frames, it strikes me, I mean, now Xi Jinping has solidified you know, his, his grip on power, he's sought and, and won this historic third term, mm. when we're talking about such long time frames and we're talking about an authoritarian power w which, you know, it, it, to some extent is going to create structural weaknesses there mm. in the long term. I mean, if you, there are no easy, smooth pathways for transfers of power. There's, there are going to be risks around social cohesion and, and this, you know, very, very centralized economic growth model as part of the political compact that the president has, mm. has sold to his citizens. Mm. How are we taking decisions about, you know, if we're looking at such long time frames, how, how can we make an assessment about where China's actually going to be at those points? Because it does strike me that there is often a sense of um, now having been heads in the sand for mm. such a long time, there's now also a kind of doctrine of the um, idea of an inevitability of constant rise and progress in China's trajectory. Uh, how, how do you mm. see those assessments being made? That's a really that, that's, that's a really uh, important question. It's one of the I think it's one of the key policy questions for all of our governments. How do you anticipate the the plausible futures for China and build that into your policy planning? And I, so the, the Australian edition of my book on the Indo-Pacific has the sub 
title of um, why China won't map the future, and so I've been accused of being a kind of China declinist. Um, I'm certainly not, not a China collapsist. I think I think you know there is um, you know obviously a huge robustness in uh, the stranglehold that the Communist Party has on power in China, but it's incredibly important for us to avoid uh, that sense of fatalism that China is on an inevitable rise and that liberal democracies and others uh, are on some sort of inevitable decline. You know, we've seen so much agency, firstly, in the past few years in the democratic world, whether it's in the uh, resistance to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, or whether it's the way, for example, that a country like India has pushed back against China um, on its contested borders in recent years. And in the Australian story, the fact that a democracy of 25 million people took a stand against economic coercion is now finding a new um, sense of stabilisation in that relationship, but hasn't relented, hasn't um, retreated on its um, on its principles. So there's a really varied dynamic to understand, and arguing without question, without even evidence, that China's on this inevitable growth path, and that it will dominate the Indo-Pacific, will be the leading power in the world. That there's no point standing in the way that either. Um, you know, that, that, that either you, you, you get with the program um, or somehow you're punished. And of course, that is at odds with China's argument that it's a benign power as well. That has to be challenged at every turn. It doesn't mean we have to go to simple notions that China will collapse, but there is a crowded and expanding horizon of risk that Xi Jinping's China faces. It's demographic. Uh, you know, it's quite possible that India already is overtaking China in the size of its population, and certainly the ageing demographic in China is becoming an enormous burden um, that shows that China doesn't always get long-term planning right. Uh, there's the whole uh, sort of frontier of dissent uh, that the Chinese system faces. You know, we all know what happened in Hong Kong. We all know uh, the um, determination of the people of Taiwan um, to pursue their own, their own path. Uh, not in a way that provokes China, but in a way that preserves uh, one of the healthiest democracies anywhere in the world, frankly. And all the other pools of dissent uh, in China that we don't see that often, but when they do emerge, can gather very quickly. So I think actually in a way, by protecting our interests and helping China help itself by setting limits to its ambition and its overreach, we're going to be supporting stability in the long run and actually helping China prepare for a future where mm -hmm. 20 years from now it's going to be dealing with enormous internal challenges. Uh, that doesn't mean that China is not going to be a source of security risk. I think it will be a source of security risk, but in some ways uh, the greatest risk from a great power comes not when it's rising, but in that window between the beginning of its decline and its realisation that it really um, is in trouble. And that's the kind of window I worry about for China in the next 20 years. You know, when the Belt and Road becomes a kind of empire on speed that begins to fray at the edges and where China either has to intervene to protect its interests or accept that it can't sustain all of this. Indeed, so we have to prepare our security apparatus to deal with a, an emboldened China but also a weakened China, yeah. which, which is very different. Yeah, and I, think, and I think, you know, I think very good work goes on typically in intelligence agencies and thinking about uh, alternative futures, uh, my college does a lot of work on futures analysis, but translating that into really clear um, narratives for policy makers is the hard bit. And I think in many ways, educating policy leadership uh, and the media about these alternative futures is, is vitally important because we are in a narrative battle. Have we got time for one tiny quick question before we wrap up? Yes. Thanks very much. Very, very, so Alexander Evans from London School of Economics very much echo that point on, on thinking about how do we educate for a generational challenge yeah. on this. Uh, you talked about some of the capability gaps. I'd just be really interested in any reflections you have about the possibility to further intensify joint work by governments, by, particularly by democratic governments, but also within AUKUS, on wider policy making. Uh, because it, in essence, the, the, the intimacy has always been in that foreign and security policy yeah. joint work. Um, but if we're preparing for a, a generation of policy channel challenge in a, in a more contested international operating environment, yeah. shouldn't we be collaborating and working more closely on lots of policy fronts? 
Short answer, absolutely. I mean, I think in many ways uh, you, you know, your question contains the answer there. I have, I, I, I would have a, um, an observation about the we, who, who is the we in this. I think um, that AUKUS is important because it's about incredibly trusted capability cooperation. And it's not, it's not, not just the trust thing, it's the fact that the United States and the United Kingdom have the capabilities that Australia would like to build for itself, um, that if we pool our resources, uh, the experience we've had over the years with intelligence sharing, for example, can translate, I think, pretty well into um, capability sharing as well. But when you go to the broader set of policy responses, you know, if you're looking at supply chain security, if you're looking at tech standards, uh, you know, if, if you're looking at social resilience, if you're looking at policies for... I guess, mobilisation or preparedness of democratic societies, we can cast the net much wider and we should cast the net much wider. Uh, so, you know, there's an enormous amount we can learn working with uh, European partners, for example. I mean, I um, was just in Paris uh, last week looking at their Defence Strategic Review, which interestingly uses the term war economy. Now, I'd be really interested to see whether either Britain or Australia are willing to use the term we must prepare the nation for a war economy in a public document. So some of our friends in Europe are thinking that way. Um, certainly, I think I mentioned earlier, um, some of the Nordic countries, you know, Finland, for example, have done this for decades. We should be having deep policy dialogue with them about, frankly, how do you do it? Um, and we should be looking at partners across the globe, and especially the Indo-Pacific, you know, for Australia, uh, Japan, I would say, is probably number one in that regard. But also some of the smaller countries that have their own uh, systems of robustness. I mean, Singapore, an obvious one, uh, and those countries that have a kind of resilience even when they deal with problems every day, like, like like India, for example. So, I think you're right, but I think this can be a much broader conversation than the three um, August governments or even the, the five of us. Thank you very much. Um, we will have to wrap up there. I want to say a huge apology to our online audience for our technical difficulties fielding your questions, but. Um, Hopefully we will be privileged enough to host uh, Professor Metcalf again in, in the future. Thank you so much for your um, generosity of time and, and kind of really thoughtful and deep responses. Uh, we absolutely, I think, are in a mindset here in, in the UK at the moment where we understand and really value the importance of our alliances. And I think the Australia alliances is very very much at the top of that list. So um, it's hugely illuminating for us as we, as we try and tackle some of these big challenges together to hear those perspectives from uh, the antipodes. And uh, we will be delighted to host you here again at Policy Exchange in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you so much.